basically, I think what sociology tries to do is try to encompass a whole variety of perspectives, and so that history is part of them. And so I think by delving into some of the sociological literature, it tries to put a wider context around what's going on. And it may also be easier to try to move things from the past and make them relevant to today. And so I think some of the research that my focus has been on is historical, but I think a lot of the factors that come out of that are relevant in 2017. Basically what we do is use a, a definition that was really developed by the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People way back in 1909-1910. And it's a, it's, a, it's a murder that is done by three or more people. Now there's some, there's some sort of wiggle room with that in terms of uh, if a person is being robbed by three people and they're murdered, that we wouldn't consider that a lynching. So that's not exact. It's, it, it's one of those things that it's pretty clear in most cases what is, and it's only at the margins where it's a little ambiguous. Is this a lynching, is it not? But basically it's the extra legal killing of another human being by three or more people. What I do with students is I say, all right, we've talked about this in the past. Let's bring it to today. Now, the difference is, is that if you have some people threaten to do some violence, government officials get involved. Okay, so it's different. I said, on the other hand, think about the rhetoric that you often hear about Muslims and think about what would it take, for example, to mobilize people if they thought that there was a Muslim family living down the road who were planning to be terrorists. They had a rumor of that. Okay? Think about it within that context or how easy it would be to spread some kind of rumor and organize people by the internet or cell phones okay, so that you could bring more people together quicker. I said, you know, so think about what I would say is that it's easy to separate yourself from the lynch mob. I would never do that. And my argument is anybody would do it under the right circumstances. And so that it's the circumstances. It's not they were worse people. It's that it was the circumstances. And that's not to say that they're not responsible for their behavior. They certainly were. But the point is it's that it's something that afflicts human nature. And so we have to think about what lessons can we learn about human nature from this and how is it applied to what's happening today. Okay, I taught my first college class. I was a master's student. Actually, uh, in 47 years ago, this summer. And um, surprisingly, I enjoyed it. And so I've enjoyed teaching ever since. One of the things that took me a while to understand is that if you want people to remember things, you need to link intellectual things with emotional things. Now, some things that, that, that's hard to do. In mathematics, it's hard to do. But in sociology, that's not hard to do. And in my particular area, dealing with mob violence, is that what I wanted with the visuals is I want them to have an emotional impact. I don't want this to be a sterile thing. I want them to feel some, some emotional um, revulsion. And by tying that in with the facts and various things, then I think it'll have a bigger impact and students will retain it. In fact, I'm almost convinced that anytime you can tie emotion in with something, that it's gonna be something that's gonna be retained. And so that's why visuals to me, they're unpleasant, they, they're disturbing, they may cause people to feel uneasy, and I think that's good. That's the response I'm looking for. The reason I'm smiling is there's a couple ways of spinning that. One is that he was a white man, and so it's easier to forget about black people that were lynched. Um, the, another thing is, is that what you have is it was so public, I mean, and, and, I mean publicized, is that the, uh, during the trial in 1913, it was all over the newspapers, days on end. It was highly anti-Semitic, highly prejudicial because he was an outsider. He was Jewish. So then you get to the events that occurred, then he was, his uh, sentence was commuted, and the newspapers around that. So he became sort of a cause celeb by racists, uh, and not so much in the, in the, against blacks, but against outsiders. 
Then the reaction in the rest of the country was that, you know, again, you can spin this as that people outside may have been less concerned about black victims, but here you had a northerner coming down, taken out by a mob. The evidence was, was weak to none and killed. And so it, it got publicity all over, the, all over Western Europe as well as the United States. So it becomes the one that's, that's well known. I first approached this as, as an academic thing. And so I was interested in scholarship. I was trying to understand it from an academic point of view. And then I became involved with a group that was dealing with a particularly violent lynching in 1946 of two young black men and women, their, their husband and wives. And a group that was trying to do certain things, get a historical marker. And so it became, um, it became a sense of personal involvement. This is where you transition from the academic to something where this has value is that uh, this is an important event, this has value, we want to try to find their burial places, we want to try to build a marker, we want to sponsor some scholarships for, for high school kids, and so this has some real world implications. And so it became a very important part of my, my life was that involvement with that group. And so then that led me with interest with other sort of memorials. The, uh, there has been a growth in that remembrance movement in the last decade. Well, where I've been, been asked to be a, an expert witness is typically in civil cases of where um, there's been some kind of, of interracial problem and all of a sudden we start seeing especially nooses appearing, either pictures of nooses or drawings or physical objects. And the, the, the thing about those, they're symbolic, but that doesn't mean they're unimportant. And they have a very big impact, just in the same way that a swastika has a, a, a much more intense meaning for a Jew than to a Gentile. It just gets your gut harder. Okay, so when you have these kinds of symbols around, they're, they're important, okay, because they are a form of sort of psychological terrorism, if nothing else. And so that's why I uh, think that uh, I can try to put that noose within historical context of why that would seem to have you know, much more of an impact if you're African American than if you're white. It's the most easily adaptable symbol if you want to make a racial statement. In the last 15 years, there has been an explosion of resources on the internet. It's, uh, many newspapers are digitized. You can do searches. You can find out a wealth of information. In fact, on the very topic of lynchings, there is a wealth of websites, uh, there's places you can go, there are maps, there's a, some of them are interactive maps, that uh, becomes a really good teaching tool. To, so students can do projects, uh, they can look up their own county, they can do, uh, you can link those to census records, there's just an enormous amount of stuff out there that was not available 15 years ago. And so uh, teachers today are blessed with the internet and anything they want to do with mob violence of finding information. Well, I, I like data. I mean, I like having things of where you can try to show, I do graphs a lot, and cause, partially because I tend to be a visual learner myself, and so I find any presentation like that, I internalize it better. Um, others may be quite different, but there is a lot of data out there. Now, you know, others may just be a turnoff, and so, you've, again, you've got to know your audience, which way do you play it? And um, I try to do a narrative and data, and I want to support things, saying Here are, here's the information I'm using to support this particular view or conclusion. Um, so anyway, I think just, you can play with data, and there's a lot out there. There's a lot of stuff out there that you can use to your advantage. What I do is um, I search for key terms, and I try to document cases. Um, I start, sometimes you get where you, uh, you look at an article and it'll give you a piece of information to spin off then to go look for other things. And so it can be, uh, it can grow almost exponentially when you become interested. 
but it's a matter of going through looking and trying to document cases and doing it with multiple newspapers so that you can get how to different newspapers did they report different things is there a different slant uh, that kind of thing becomes very important and today it's really easy because again a lot of it's digitized and searchable newspapers often get things wrong and so you can have a report that later turns out to be false um, and it could be that the incident happened but not at the place they said you know or the person uh, they mentioned there turned out not to be the person who was the victim so what you have to do is I like to go to find as many sources as possible to look and see what can we establish as reasonably certain that this happened where it happened and who did it happen to and so that's why it takes some some work to do so Teachers in the best position to know. They know their class, they know the maturity, they know who can deal with things and who can't. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, I think they would be the best judge of that. There was a, a teacher that I work with in an adjoining county that would have me come over and do a high school AP history lecture. So we're talking about high school students AP. Um, I certainly would not want to do anything like this dealing with younger people. Uh, it, I don't think they had the you could arguably whether or not high schools have the material, the maturity, but certainly younger don't. And so I would not do that. Uh, with the high school kids, and it was an AP class, they asked good questions. And so, and it was talking about events in their neighborhood, in their things that they'd never heard about. And so they were learning about things in the community. First of all, you always, I think, want to give some kind of statement first. And you want to make a statement about uh, what we're going to talk about can be disturbing. Um, and it's, 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 you're sort of warning people that this is not going to be an easy topic. Okay? And you have to take it very seriously. And so you approach it that way. The, and the, more the, the younger the audience is, the more difficult that is to do. Okay? But what you can try to do is set that as a tone and then you then see how people react. And the important part is watching, trying to read your audience and seeing what are the facial expressions, what's, what's going on. And then you can sort of know where to go and where not to go. Um, and I think that that's, I've had, I've given a lot to interracial groups before or to only to black groups before. And typically the reactions have always been quite sobering. Um, and uh, non-confrontational because you, you, you know you're talking about a tragedy and so I think it's also you know it's important to think about the context of that tragedy and most people I think will take that seriously you know and sometimes you might get you can get sometimes laughter but it's not laughter funny it's it's I feel uncomfortable I'm nervous there's a sort of a noise that sometimes people make doing that and I think it's just important to realize that that's what it is. It's not you're being funny. It's just that this is, you know, nervousness. Uh, because it it's, can be difficult to approach. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And so it, there's no way you can simplify the issue, I think, make it easy. Uh, and you just have to know your audience about where you can go.